The Spin-Off Podcast Network. K-pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The Spin-Off's new documentary, k p o l i s follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K-pop. In a one-off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side-eyes you. But in K-pop, they're just like, no, like, celebrate yourself. Watch k p o l i s today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. Kia ora koutou katoa, and welcome to Business is Boring. There are a lot of meals in a week where people involve meat, but it isn't really the main event. A spag bowl here, a nachos there maybe, and amongst all that tomato and spice and sour cream and cheese, you could pretty easily swap out the mince for a plant alternative, or bulk it out super easily. There are environmental and health benefits, and it's an idea having a moment. The rise of flexitarian eating and cooking that doesn't always default to meat and veg has seen a bunch of food innovation recently and one Kiwi company from Northland that's making waves in the space is Vince. They have a cool approach of dehydrating their product so it doesn't need cold chain storage and like a sun-dried tomato, keeps strong flavour. Simply add a cup of boiling water, wait five minutes or so and you're ready to go. It's been winning awards for its taste and its smarts. And to talk making a meat alternative, clean ingredients, and what's next, Nigel and Debbie Stowe join us now. Thank you for coming down here. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Hey, yeah, thanks for coming down. So you, you made the trip from Whangarei mm-hmm. to, to see us, which um, we're very grateful for. Um, tell us about your path into business, as um, the two of you had like a really successful cafe in Whangarei. Yeah, so uh, back in 2007, Oh, well, actually, it started before that. I had a, um, I started an IT business a couple of years out of uni, a uh, couple of mates, and we thought, oh, we can, we can provide this probably better than what our current employers are. So we struck out with a bunch of skills, and um, we did that for a few years and learned a bit about business. And um, I was ready to move on. Um, Debbie was a chef, and I think um, we decided that being a chef was... Um, A tough family choice. So we used to see each other about eight hours a week total, probably. So Debs was working at some pretty high profile, at a fairly high profile restaurant, coming home at four o'clock in the morning and getting up at one in the afternoon. And I was nine to five. So saw each other for a day <laughs> a week, basically. Um, and then, yeah, we decided, what, well, what are we going to do? Debs knew that she didn't want to. We'd been living in Auckland for a while and we were. Ready to make a move. We were thinking about starting a family. We we're like, we don't really want to stay in Auckland, raise our family here. I grew up in Whangarei. So we we're like, well, we'd been looking to、um, start a business. So we thought, well, let's open a cafe in Whangarei. This, the hospitality scene wasn't amazing and we felt like we could make our mark there.、Um, so we moved to Whangarei and yeah, opened a cafe. Awesome.、Mm. And then you got to choose to spend、uh, like a thousand hours a week working together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. yeah、um, we were warned against that. Yeah. People used to say,、oh, don't you like, you obviously don't enjoy being married, like,、yeah. like running a cafe together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, what's it like? Because, I mean, cafes, you know, you wander up and you have your nice cup of coffee, but、um, there's so much work、oh, around, the, so much. around the hours of opening. I mean, Nigel actually wasn't a coffee drinker and didn't actually start drinking coffee until we decided. <laughs> We were going to open a cafe, <laughs> and then、yeah. he ended up being like Northland barista champion and going to nationals to judge, and、yeah. really got into it in a big way. But like with the cafe, <laughs> there's so many aspects to it. Like there's the back of house,、mm. the kitchen, front of house, and then there's the business side with the finances. So we kind of just. 
divvy it up. I was always looking after the staff. <laughs> mm. Which is, is like running a nursery sometimes, isn't it? Like, <laughs> well, it was quite incredible. You know, yeah, yeah, a lot of young females, you know, we mm. employed and I just like, yeah, you, you can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really is like, it is like a family mm. and a yeah, lot of them were quite young. Mm. So we were kind of like their parents. Yeah, yeah, it's like finishing school for teenagers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's yeah. exactly what it was like for quite a number of them. And we'll get to this probably a little bit later, but that was what gave us our our purpose and what we really mm. enjoyed about the cafe. Mm. Um, I mean, Debs loves the rush of the kitchen and, you know, the lunch rush mm. and the breakfast rush. She loves that sort of hustle and bustle. Um, you know, I was more on the business side like I love being nimble and just doing kind of what we thought was right um, and we reinvented ourselves in that cafe about man four or five times we completely changed direction we did dinners yeah. for a while we were kind of not fine dining but we were kind of a high level of dining and then we completely switched it and we went pizzas and then we tried something else and then we shut it all down and then we went into catering. So at, at the at the peak, we were turning over about a million dollars a year for a Northland cafe that was, I think, five times the average. Yeah, and, and uh, five years in a row, the the number one cafe in the region, hey? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Until they stopped doing the awards. <laughs> <laughs> Sick of these guys winning it. We're, yeah, we're closing these down. <laughs> yeah, well, we. Um, I mean, I used to go to Whangarei a bit on business, and. Um, in Auckland, it's like, you know, fridge was my favourite place to bring food from. Uh, up there, they're like, oh, just bring us some pies and donuts from the bakery. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, there's a bit of a gap here. Debbie's uh, uncle was a lawyer um, or QC, and he used to go to court, and there was nothing near the courts. And we realised that behind the courts, there was lawyers and accountants, and there was just nothing there for them. So when we built the cafe, we were very particular about the way that we built it. So we had the coffee machine down the front around the corner so that people could have business meetings without the noise. Uh, we built out our tables bigger than usual because we knew that lawyers needed to spread papers and things. So we're very particular about the way that we actually built the cafe, um, which also caused us some problems because we could have 50 or 60 people down the back and it looked like we were empty. <laughs> And people would be like, oh, well, you know, you go past the place and you're like, oh, that place can't be any good. There's no one in it. But, you know, down around the corner, we're absolutely packed. And that was a bit of a issue for us. Yeah. Um, and I think with the cafe too, one of my main purposes was I wanted to be a good employer. Mm -hmm. I mean, going through the hospitality industry myself and being a female chef, you know, you kind of in those environments where you're not always treated amazingly, you kind of mm -hmm. feel like you have to slink away into the corner when the when the guys are, you know, chatting about what they chat about. And, <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to be a place that people wanted to work. Yeah. That, um, no swearing, no throwing around pots and pans and having yeah. tantrums. And <laughs> it's safe, safe spaces, hey. Like I worked yeah. in cafes and, and, and restaurants and, um, and and bars. And, yeah, like, like when I was saying, it's like finishing school. Like yeah. there's so yeah. many people like learning to drink, learning to go out, learning to be responsible, yeah. learning to be independent. And the yeah. amount of pastoral care and management in yeah. cafes and restaurants That's is right. wild. Yeah. yeah, And hospitality isn't necessarily seen as a desirable um it's not a career, yeah, right? Yeah, when you're leaving school. So, I mean, you get a lot of people applying that aren't highly skilled. But, mm. I mean, that's that's what I actually liked. I liked mm. getting someone on board that had the right attitude, that just wanted to give it a go, but didn't have a lot of skills because, I mean, I could impart what I knew. I mm. could, you know, teach them those things. Yeah, um, um, some of the best stuff that we ever had came out of um, things like Ministry of Social Development programs and things that we had... You know, one amazing girl who'd had a car crash and, you know, she had to learn how to rewalk and things. And, you know, she was awesome, but she also had a lot of challenges. And, you know, that was amazing. She was with us for Their maybe seven years. Just... Yeah, no self-esteem. And mm. um, we had a couple of other um, staff members that were like that as well. Like we had one that couldn't even speak in the interview because she was so nervous and she turned out to be one of our best kitchen staff that we ever had. And she was like the gold standard for everybody else coming into the I, kitchen. And I can't believe I actually employed someone that walked in for, for the interview in their socks. <laughs> 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 She's just socks. Well, and that's kind of like... What the, is this girl? But 
She was amazing. Yeah. I suppose yeah. a bit like the <laughs> army like that, isn't it? And that like, you know, it doesn't matter what you come in as, if you'll do the work, if you'll yeah. follow the systems, yeah. if you'll put yeah. the, the time in. Uh, and also, uh, like the army, the hours are terrible. <laughs> the yeah. pays are really yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that's You're right. meant to tough it all that's out. Right. Yeah. And it's in amongst all that was like um the but the camaraderie is, mm, is, is exactly. like, makes it so fun. Like yeah. there's there's nothing like it. And and in amongst all that, you had kids mm. and then what was the beginning of of the Vince idea is that was kind yeah. of part to do with the cafe and part mm. to do with children, hey? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we the way that it worked out was uh, we were trying to have children. It wasn't really happening for us. And we're like, okay, let's go do this cafe instead. Signed the lease on the cafe, got pregnant like two weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Let's go. so yeah we're building the cafe our daughters are the bassinet out the back with the builders out the front and she was there a lot of the time actually while we we're running the cafe mm. out the back as well um the, the customers love seeing the kids grow mm. up too so we yeah. had a very family focused mm. kind of environment yeah. um yeah but when our second came along um that was when um life kind of really started to change for us i guess she was fine up until about six months and then all of a sudden she developed you know, this crippling stomach pain. She couldn't sleep. She just started breaking out in eczema and she was just, oh, she was so unhappy. And it made You couldn't things, put her down. You just have to hold her the whole time. Yeah, and things got extremely mm. difficult for us because all of a sudden, you know, we're running this cafe with 20-odd staff and we're just not getting any sleep at all. Um, our first child, by comparison, was a bit of a breeze. Yeah, we went through all the specialists. We went through the hospital for years. Um, I mean, it was so bad that we used to, cover her head to toe in all these special creams and things. We would tape socks to her hands so that she couldn't scratch herself in the night. Um, she'd scream for like an hour before she got to sleep. And then when she finally got to sleep, she'd wake up at 11, almost, you know, you could just about set your alarm to it. And we'd dose her up with pain medication and um, amaprazole and a couple other things. And then she'd wake up again at two, same routine, and that carried on night after night for years. Yeah, it was pretty heartbreaking. I mean, pretty much having to hold her arms down and cradle her to get her to sleep, you know, it was, it yeah. was so I would hard to pin watch. her and basically hold her head so she couldn't move. Yeah. Debs would like force the syringe down like her throat. Abuse. Oh boy. <laughs> She'd choke yeah. and throw up and just oh, I was terrible. Mm. And one night I kind of we just I just reached breaking point and yeah. I was like, this is not right. Like we you know, we've been listening to these specialists for over two years and just nothing's getting better. So I sat down at my computer and I was like, eczema, oh Dairy, okay, well, I know that I've got an issue with dairy, even though we were eating it. I was like, I used to, dairy used to give me asthma, used to give me allergies. Maybe it's that. Kept Googling, oh, okay, gluten, right, all right. So we went to the went into the cupboard and that morning got rid of all our gluten, all our dairy, completely flipped our diet. Um, Which as a chef, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah, it was quite a big thing. Yeah, and then we went away on holiday um, up north and we ate, fish that we caught ourselves and fresh veggies from the local growers. And we did that for about 10 days and she slept through the night. Yeah. We were like, wow, okay, that's, amazing. that's interesting. And then she slept. Actually, we went and checked to make sure she was still breathing. <laughs> it's like, you, you, you go check. <laughs> yeah. You wake up at 11, oh, yeah. there's no noise. Yeah. Wake yeah. up at 2, what? Yeah, that was incredible. Yeah. Um, and then she slept through again and again and again, like four nights in a row. And we were like, okay, that's not a coincidence. Went back to the specialist and they were like, oh, cool, she's growing out of it. And we were like, no. I was like, <laughs> yeah. no way. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, oh, well, you can't take milk out of her diet. Like, that's dangerous. Um, and if you yeah. do, she'll we, have... We, if you do that, you're going to have to feed her five... Three litres of soy a day five, or something. Uh, yeah, it was five litres of soy a you know, week, it's like... I was like, know. I'm not doing that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, was, and we yeah. kind of just went with our gut instinct and her health just keep improving. About three months later, um, as I continued, because I love learning, I love research, I was like, oh, what about meat? And at that time, I think maybe food ink and things like that. Oh, I found Scott Jurek, who's a runner, and I didn't read his book other than I was getting into running at that point because I'd just lost like 15 kilos in about three months, which was pretty insane. The, cus the customers thought, asked if Knight had cancer because yeah. he had just dropped all this weight so quickly. <laughs> from, uh, from cutting out the dairy from, and from the From cutting out gluten. dairy, gluten and... Um, well, it wasn't even meat at no, that stage. No, it wasn't meat that stage, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we'd done the research and things and then we were like, well, what about meat? Um, and this was 2000 and... Because while she was doing better, her digestion still was struggling a little. Yeah. So we're like, well, what else can we do, you know, yeah. by changing our lifestyle? 
Mm. So we dug a bit deeper. Yeah, and then we were like, okay, let's remove meat. And man, so that that massive boost in energy that we'd all had mm. over that three months happened again mm. over the next three months. And all of a sudden it was like, man, like things just, I and the cafe become easier. Yeah. Like our mental um, attitude and resilience and toughness got so much better. We were much less irritable with each other. And I mean, obviously getting sleep helped with that as well, but yeah. um, continued to drop weight. And I started running long distances and, um, yeah, it just things just got better and better and better for us, and um, I became an evangelical vegan he keyboard sure, warrior, he, he, yeah, he <laughs> arguing sure with everybody I could find about, and started what, telling all our customers about. Yeah, yeah, you be <laughs> oh, don't eat, <laughs> don't eat the specials. <laughs> well, actually, well, <laughs> go to the fruit shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we, well, once, once yeah. we had experienced that, we're like, oh, we've we've got to share this, so we just did overhaul of the cafe yep. and what we were serving, and sat down and rewrote all our menus. Yep. So what we did was, and I'm. Hopefully, um, I've seen it happen occasionally in cafes, but we took meat out of every dish that we had and we added it back as an optional extra because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. as, a, as a vegetarian or a vegan at that point, it's like you get the chicken taken out of your salad and you just end up with lettuce and tomatoes or something. Mm. Um, so we designed like, I mean, Debs is an amazing chef. She designed lots of things like, I mean, this is where the idea for Vince kind of started mm. to appear. I mean, yeah, I had to sort of retrain myself as well without... Adding all the, you know, as a chef, it's like your aim is to please, you know, your customer, make something amazing, use what you need to use to make that amazing. Mm. And now I have to do that, but I have to take out all your, the meat and the dairy and the gluten and just just changing my style. So we were doing these amazing big salads, and but people were loving them because they were interesting salads, you know. And um, I think um, the important part there was we developed the nacho mix. Yeah, yeah. And um, we didn't say that it wasn't meat. We just said nachos. Um, because what we found at the cafe is if we said gluten-free brownie, it wouldn't sell. If you said brownie with a little wee GF after it, it's so <laughs> small you could barely read it. it sells like normal. <laughs> yeah. So we did that with the nachos and we just did nachos. Yeah. And we, I mean, we put what was in it in the, you know, in the menu. Yeah. We but people don't read but, that. Oh, and also <laughs> if, you, if you don't eat meat, people often don't put things like beef mints in their nacho thing. Because, yeah, exactly. Well, they don't say there's beef mint because it's just so accepted that it is. That's and then right. you're like, oh, oh, there's a whole lot of beef in my nachos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. And um, yeah, well, people were ordering the nachos and they'd get halfway through it and they would be like, hey, this is really good, but what is it? And I'd be like, oh, it's, it was on the menu. It's, it's quinoa nachos. And they would be like, oh, okay, what's that? What's quinoa? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the thing. Yeah, what was yeah. it? What's quinoa? Um, we're like, you know, it's kind of like a seed. It's a grain. It's really good for you. And um, uh, most of our customers were sort of lawyers, probably about mm-hmm. 60, 70% of them. And um, a lot of them um, had been told that, you know, they need to cut back on um, fat and salt and for heart disease and all sorts of things. You know, being a lawyer is a stressful job and typically they eat out a lot. And it was a it was a recurring theme that we started to see through our customers and we become known um, over those few years for really leading the way. And there weren't any vegan or vegetarian cafes in Whangarei, so mm. we attracted all those crowds. And, and as a chef, like, yeah. you know, um, because what you just said before, Debbie, about mm. the, um, you know, people... You know, I think people really expect to see a big bit of bacon or yeah. a chunk of chicken, or because yeah. I know because we, we we don't eat red, red meat at home mm. um, or, or or at all. But don't mm. do any cooking with um with with any red meat. And I had to you know over the last kind of five years, I've had to retrain myself not only to cook yeah. but also not to kind of like look for a big obvious chunk of protein mm. or else I don't feel like I'm satisfied or something, mm. you know? Yeah. Like it's kind of, you, you're so trained into yeah. being like yeah. every meal needs a big old hunk of meat in it. Yeah. Well, mm. I guess, I mean, the fat and meat is the satiating part, right? So if you do want to eat mainly more vegetables, um, you know, it does require a bit more effort and that's where a lot of, uh, falls over for a lot of people because get home from work and it's just, you're exhausted, you just want to eat and it's easy to just chuck a bit of meat in the fry pan and, yeah. you know. Everyone can barbecue a bit of steak. Oh, like. Pretty easy and then chuck a bit of broccoli and, oh, look at me, yeah. Master yeah. Chef over exactly. here. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, look, yeah. at, look at the range of vegetables and fruits that's available to us. It's amazing and all the flavours. Yeah, and it's so wild to think that, 
you got that advice from the specialists to say, we need to be drowning our kids in milk and feeding all the meat. Yeah. It's like they haven't heard of, I don't know, India? Billion, yeah. billion yeah. people there <laughs> know, right? who are, are, are yep. churning out more PhDs and more, yep. um, more more big brainiacs than anywhere else in the world, mm-hmm. and they're doing it on lentils and mm-hmm. you know, like as as a as a country diet. Like we yep. have this like cultural insecurity that everything has to be milk and meat. Mm. Yeah. But you know, China and uh, Japan yeah. and yep. India and all of these countries with yeah. different food traditions, they're not drinking milk and eating meat yeah. three meals a day. No, no that's right. No. And all the herbs and spices that we've got available to us as well and I mean you do like a beautiful soup or a stock and it's those veggies that give it the amazing aroma and flavour as well Mm. Um, but I mean a lot of the like Nigel said you know we love our research and one of the things that we've come across time and time again is that the amount of time that people are spending in the kitchen is getting shorter and shorter and shorter Mm. and it's like how do we become healthier when we're spending less time in the kitchen and um, that was one of the ideas behind Vince too. It's like we've got to make something that is super crazy easy, <laughs> you know, for people to prepare at home when they've, mm. they've got, you know, kids running around and, you know. Trying well, we, to- I mean, we took our experiences from living in Auckland where you work until 5, takes you until 6.30 to get home depending on where you're living, and are you really going to then, you're hungry at that point, are you going to really sit down for an hour if you're not a chef <laughs> and cook something that's healthy for you, not not really. Mm. Um, yeah, we do actually eat it like nine most nights. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it takes an hour and a half. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what we found yeah, yeah. as well when we were living here, and it, it all almost always ended up being like burger fuel or uh, <laughs> Indian summer <laughs> was like our two go tos, yeah. and we'd have that maybe four nights a week, and you know I put on probably 15 kilos while I was in Auckland, and it was mainly just the takeaways. So we're like, right, we know that. We want to impact on health for people. That's one of the main things. That's one of our drivers. But I also know that something that Debbie didn't understand was not being a chef and coming up having no cooking skills. So when I met Debs at uni, it was like my idea of uh, gourmet was onions on my sausage (laughs) and bread. (laughs) Um, It's actually not very easy. And it's really hard to be plant-based if you don't have those cooking skills because... You know, how do you make vegetables Yo. taste good and it takes time? And balance, you know, a full balanced meal. Yeah, so there's more things that you need to consider than just taste as well. We'll be back in a moment to hear from Nigel and Debbie how they went about building Vince as a business. Spark is proud to partner with the Sustainable Business Network and the Climate Action Toolbox. The free Climate Action Toolbox can provide you with simple step-by-step guides to measure and reduce your emissions. Help lead the way to a low-carbon future for New Zealand. Visit sparklab.co.nz forward slash sustainability to find out more. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. And we're back with Debbie and Nigel Stowe from Vince Plant-Based Veggie Mints. Hey, so tell me, how did you go about taking this kind of new awareness of uh, of wanting to swap out meat and dairy for for more kind of like veggie-based things and actually turn it into um, a product? Like, what kind of steps are involved in making something um, into into something that you can sell? Yeah, it's pretty uh, tough question. I think it's... You know, we've listened to a lot of the um, guests through your podcast and everybody kind of has their own journey. It's There's no real um, blueprint to it, I don't think. So for us, we sold the cafe 
Um, we had a granola product that we were making through the cafe that we were actually dehydrating ourselves. And at the time, we were thinking about this convenience with our young kids and being really busy and wanting to eat more vegetables and being healthy. And just one day, I think I just said to Debs, can we dehydrate our like vegetable mints? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I think when we went plant-based, I really missed those easy-to-prepare family favourites that used beef mints like your nachos and your bolognese. You know, they're easy to easy to make and um, you didn't need to think about it. You could just get home, chuck it together and um, it, was, it was easy. Yeah, we, well, so what we did was is we entered the pick. Yeah. So at this point, we, we'd we sold the cafe. We'd been catering for a couple of years. Um, we built out a commercial kitchen inside our house. Mm -hmm. So we were essentially working from home. And yeah, we entered a competition called The Pick and we had this granola product that we used to sell at the cafe. It was featured in a couple of cookbooks, top 50 cafes of New Zealand. We had customers wanting to buy it all the time and we were like, well, let's just sell the granola. Pretty naive about starting a FMCG brand at that point, which I think one of your, um, you know, one of the things we were going to talk about is what does it take to start a business? And we were just discussing it. Naivety is um, <laughs> quite a large yeah. part of that. It's like, a big bonus. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of yeah. have to not know what you're in for, I guess, yeah. otherwise you might never start. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, we were selling the granola to friends and family and local specialty stores, local shops. Um, but when I went through the pick, which was an accelerator um, put on by Northland Inc., I sort of, we came to the market analysis and it's kind of like, yeah, this is going to be a hard sell. Mm, it's a premium saturated. product. It's mm. a flooded market. And I'd been making this uh, veggie mints at home for my family. And it's like, but I don't want to do something chilled. <laughs> Having mm. run the cafe, you know, would have about 10 different fridge freezer units. One was always playing up and I knew that the freight to get the chilled stuff cost more. It's like, and we were like, well, yeah, let's let's try dehydrating it. Mm, Let, yeah, we were worried about we we're worried about food waste as well. Mm. We'd lost our chiller at the cafe probably oh, like so once a year, times. throwing out so much food all the time. Um, so we were thinking about it from a food wastage point of view. Again, like some of these things, we just seem to. I don't know if it's luck, but we always seem to be a bit ahead sure, of trends. Just, well, it's ge mm. that's yeah. genius because you don't, <laughs> like, you know, if, if anyone's ever tried to sell stuff into the supermarkets, that fridge and freezer yeah. space is, like, yep. so contested, you yep, know. Like, yeah. sure. there's all kinds of deals where people have paid for the freezers yes. so mm. you can't yep. go into them and stuff. Yep. Like, it's, um, and it's a, a hard spot. Yeah. And I had a friend that was selling a frozen product um, mm. and also just, you know, the shelf life on, you know, frozen and fridge you know, there's a lot of um, credits that the suppliers have to give back. You know, they have to pay the supermarkets to throw out mm. their food. It's like, it's not sustainable. No, it's, it's wild. And so that, that dehydration is a really cool point. So mm. what, what's in the mints? Is, um, you know, like a lot of people might be familiar with, um, you know, chucking some lentils in to bulk out their, their um, spag bowl. Or they might be familiar with things like corn, which is a yep. um, mushroom Mycoprotein. kind of... Uh, Mycoprotein. Mycoprotein. Yeah, yeah. mushroomy, fungi yeah. kind of yeah. protein <laughs> kind of base. So what have, have you got, or, or like, you know, there's all these like plant protein-y things or yeah. pea pulses. Yeah. What's, what's your approach to kind of the texture and the bulking out and the, the constituency mm. of it? Yeah, so I mean, ingredients are cauliflower, carrot, celery, uh, things, tomatoes, things that you'd get from your own garden. Um, and like running the cafe, you know, whole food was really um, an important part of that. You know, food that comes out of the kitchen. I mean, when I um, looked for our family for replacements for meat, you know, I didn't want um, any of the meat alternatives that used ingredients that I couldn't recognise. It's like, if I don't know what that is, I'm not going to feed that to my children. Mm. So the whole food part of it was really important to us. Yeah, and our diet had been really clean, for mm. probably seven years up until that point, and we started, there was a few meat analogues or um, protein alternatives on the market, and we set about trying them all, and they almost all left us feeling yeah. like bloated and um, unwell, like we weren't digesting them properly. So we knew that we didn't want to use like a soy TVP or a wheat TVP or something like that. That would have been the easy way to go is just to flavour, and there's lots of those on the market now. Um, the other easy way to go would have been beans and lentils, but we also understand that they're not easily digestible by people that don't regularly eat them. And we wanted our market we wanted our market to be 
not just vegans and vegetarians. We actually wanted to have like this big impact and we wanted to be mass market, I guess, was, was always our dream from the start. And we didn't think that we could get there with beans and lentils. Yeah. So we use peanuts as our main source of um, protein. And we already knew that the market was really um, protein crazy. It's like mm. we're getting your protein from. Um, and it's been a big topic um, of conversation but we knew that this being a, a we're a source of protein, but we didn't go heavy on the protein because we know that fibre is just as important as protein. Yeah, so I mean, I guess yeah, we just wanted to keep the ingredient label recognisable, um, whole foods as possible and as unprocessed as possible. Mm. Um, and we had some experience with dehydration because we'd been making the granola, and um, yeah, it just and, and we knew that we wanted to export actually. So right from the creation of the product, we had this idea that we would be able to export it. Again, completely naive, had no idea what was involved in exporting. And uh, even now, three mm. years on, we're only just starting to learn what's actually involved in that. Mm. And that was another reason for dried. You know, so we're leaving all the nutrients in the product. We're just taking out the water. Um, there's so many benefits to that. And in each kind of like hundred gram sachet. How much vegetable goes into, goes yeah. into that? <laughs> so there's 500 grams of yeah. vegetables go into each bag before it's dried down. Mm. So, yeah, it's a great way to get your, your yeah. five plus a day. Look, if anyone's, you know, <laughs> you know, like, wilted down some spinach yeah. and you're like, yeah. there's a lot of, lot of spinach in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great example yeah. of, of yeah. actually. What, yeah. what goes into it. And in terms of that kind of peanut and protein thing, mm. because I think, like, that is, like – you know, that was my fear was, you know, I won't feel full or, you know, mm. oh, I'm going to be missing out. And there's so much like greediness and stuff kind of tied up in that. Eh? <laughs> you're yeah. like, you know, you, you, ha- you find it hard to say no to getting the, the extra bacon because you, you feel like you'll miss out and stuff. Like there's a real kind of like um, to help people transition, you kind of have got to feel like you're getting a treat, eh? Not like you're getting the lesser option. It's got to feel that's a, like that's a really that is inter- good option. Yeah, that's a really interesting insight. And um, talking about growing the business, that's actually probably been one of the hardest parts for us because our product's not uh, ice cream. It's yes. not an oat ice cream. It's not a um, plant-based sweet. It's a boring, old, like, um, savoury product. It's not... That's sexy on Instagram. No one really gets that excited about it on the forums. It, it doesn't photograph particularly well. And it, it is hard. I mean, we've had to educate our consumers as well. And I guess, you know, starting the business right before COVID hit, you know, one of our main parts of the market, you know, going to the supermarkets, we'd have, we you know, we needed to do demonstrations so we could show people what it was and what it tasted like. Because once people try it, you know, mm. you know, they love it, um, but it's been it's been quite difficult through COVID to be able to get out there and show show Vince off. And could you like because it's um, you know you just put, so how do you how do you prepare it? You, you pop it in the bowl, yep. you pour some water in, you wait five minutes, and then you just put it on top of whatever you're using. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah you can do it that way for sure. Um, so one of my favourites is the kiwi with poached egg. Great flavour pairing, just works really really well. It's one of those. Yeah, just kind of magical flavor combinations, the egg yolk and the, um, and the flavor of the kiwi. Or, um, you know, when we started selling it, our customers were like, well, actually what we're doing is we're hydrating it, we're mixing it with mints, and there's my bolognese done. Right, right. So mm-hmm. it's replacing that jar sauce, which is mainly sugar and salt. It's um, adding flavor and it's adding fiber, and it's reducing meat as well if you're just adding it to a reduced amount of beef mints. Um, and a great way to get more veg into those fussy kids yeah, that yeah. kind of push the veg to the side of the plate. Yeah, and as soon as our kids learned about that, because we hadn't eaten red meat until that point for about yeah. like 10 years probably, <laughs> and it was like, okay, well, we need to try this because all our customers are saying that they're starting to use it this way. So we tried it and we were like, wow, that is actually incredible. Like it tastes so good. And how about what you kind of like um, optimize for in terms of flavor? Because you, you, you know, like we, 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 I went through that same journey of like trying all of the meat analogs mm. and got a bit obsessed with them. But so many were like, you know, they're just other processed food. It's just yep. junk food, you know. That's like right. the, even the good ones, like um, the Linda McCartney mm. um, uh, burgers that mm-hmm. have mozzarella. Yep. So they're not vegan, but mm. they are amazing because mm. they've got like the fat yep. from the mozzarella <laughs> yep. comes out and makes mm. it delicious. Yes. But yep. so many that don't have something that's like fatty and delicious, mm. it's kind of play doughy. 
you yeah. know, or, or they've or they've um, optimized for it to be like the blood in the middle of a patty. But you mm. don't need a patty for the no. blood in the middle. No, you yeah. eat for the yummy kind of crispy mm. mallard reactiony outside. So how do you kind of optimize for like what are you going for? Are you trying to get like irony, or are you trying to get umami, or what, what, what's the kind of? Yes. Um, so we've got the three different flavors. We've got the Italian which we use, you know, for with pastas, which is great. So it's kind of got like a real tomato, herby profile. Then we've got Mexican, which um, has like the chipotle and the lime, um, you know, it's mild spices. Um, so it's family friendly again. And then we've got original kiwi. So, you know, your classic cottage pie and Vince on toast. So it's like, I guess, using my experience as a chef just to build on those flavours. So it's not relying on that fat to get that yum factor. Yeah. And in terms of uh, next steps with the business, how did you go from taking, you know, that idea and going through and, and thinking about it and turn it into kind of a, a brand and business out in the world? Because mm-hmm. you, you worked through a couple of kind of accelerators mm-hmm. and partners yeah. and stuff, hey? Yeah, I guess um, that is the way that we did it actually was through those partners and accelerators. Like we knew what we were good at. And I think Again, if you're looking at starting a business, you need to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. And if you're not good at it, then either you need to hire it in or you need to go looking. And because we were a startup, we were bootstrapping, we didn't really have a lot of cash, we went, we just started talking to people that we thought might be able to help us. Yeah, we were really lucky to um, win a spot in the Good Food Boost, which led, uh, we won the Westpac Business Awards and we were in the Good Food Boost. And then um, what happened after that? Oh, we did pretty well in Artisan Awards. And then we, um, yeah, Sprout Agritech, which was really the start of our brand journey, Mm. I guess. Mm. It was quite quite an interesting experience because all of the other companies there were heavily tech focused. And it was like, what's your IP? And we're like, well, Debbie's our IP. Like our flavor (laughs) is our IP. Uh, no, no, we can't copyright it because if somebody just kind of does it, it changes their recipe a bit, you know, it's no point in copywriting it. And um, it was quite interesting, but then we started to think about the technology and our production process that Mm. we actually were using, and the pressure starts as you scale, the pressure comes on, and I think I heard Boring Oat Milk talk about this, where the investor's like, yeah, cool, go make it in China, or go make it in Malaysia, and we're like, we don't want to do that. Like, we want to source all our products in New Zealand, we want to make it here, and more than that, we actually want to make it in Northland, Mm. and some of them were like, well, you need to make it in Auckland, because it's easier we're like, but we don't want to live in Auckland. We it's want to like, make it in Northland. They're like contract manufacturer because when you think about it, Vince is sort of two different businesses. There's a the manufacturer side mm-hmm. and then there's the FMCG side, you know, the, all the branding. And so, I mean, it is it is a lot, but we wouldn't have it any other way. Mm. I mean, we really want to have um, a large facility in Whangarei and, um, you know, help support the community and have um, help with job growth and mm. um, support growers in that region too. Uh, that's so Cool. Yeah. And what we realized was that dehydration is actually not very easy. And it's something that big producers aren't interested in because it takes so long. So our, our, our kind of product cycle takes close to 24 hours probably to make a batch. And if you're talking to contractors using production lines, they are not interested in something that ties up their production line for that long. I'll bet. Um, and on top of so we tried, we, 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 we looked at that model Three. We needed three different businesses with transportation in between. So, cook it, dehydrate it, package it, and the cost was horrific. <laughs> yeah, and the environmental impact oh, as well. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's which exactly went right. Against everything we were trying we would, to achieve. Yeah. <laughs> this is this yeah. is cool. It's like a teak bars. You know, you take the water out and send it around the world, and it's yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. Similar. yeah, yeah. James and I were talking about that yesterday. Actually, yeah. it's the same principle. Yeah. Yeah. Remove the water. Like you don't need to be shipping water around the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so and so, when did you know? Like, because um, it's really cool the the success you've had with the awards and um, the accelerators and stuff um, that that's helped. Because you know, the dream is that they provide pathways for businesses mm. yep. that mm-hmm. don't have an easy foothold. Like, because yeah. this isn't an easy foothold, eh? Like, no. con- convincing people <laughs> to try something they haven't tried. Yeah, really. Hard. Finding a place in the supermarket when there's yep. nothing else like it, and yep. all of that stuff. But yeah, like, how, how did you go about actually kind of like winning over some retailers and winning over the customers and knowing that it was working as a business? Yeah, well, I think um, the early adopters were easy. So the vegan, vegetarian customers mm-hmm. were pretty straightforward. We had good uptake from specialty stores. Um, 
it was pretty tough outside of specialty stores. Um, we got knocked back a few times, and then Faro actually took us on, and that was a massive turning yeah, point for us. It was. It was awesome. Yeah, we they believed in us straight away. They loved our ingredients. Um, and yeah, they just yeah they believed in us, and all of a sudden we're in like these four like really iconic supermarkets. We got to do um, tastings just yeah. before COVID, and people were like, "No, no, no, thanks." And they're like, "We're like, hey, there's no soy in it." Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And we realised that is a big selling uh, point, and then we started doing this hybrid. And talking about tastings, we went to, um, through Sprout. We went through um, to Field oh, Days. Yeah. Yeah. We were the innovation marquee there, and I thought, oh my gosh, taking a meat alternative to Field Days, I'm going to be <laughs> laughed out of the tent. Yeah. And wow, we were blown away, man. The response, the response was amazing. Um, like you'd have some of the farmers kind of walk, oh, they'd give you quite a wide berth. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you say, come on, come on, come and try. They're like, oh, no, no, no. But I had on my um, table, I had all the veggies out of, you know, what was in Vince. It's like, this is what you're eating, you know, it's vegetables. They're like, oh, really? So they'd try it and, you know, they loved it as well. Because, I mean, they they need ideas on how to cut back on meat too, you know. Their doctors are telling them, you know, you can't be eating red meat in this quantity seven times a week. And it's like this is a great way for them to even just cut cut back on it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was it was a great response. We, we sold out in a couple yeah, of days. Yeah, we thought we had four days stock and we sold out in a day and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and That's we were like, awesome. whoa, we need to stand the website up like overnight. So we basically stood up our web store in about eight hours yeah. <laughs> so that we could take orders. Yeah, um, it's very cool. But it was really frustrating. Like we knew there was a market for it. We just couldn't get into like any major retail. Um, although we did, yeah. luckily we've got some very um, good friends with who were con- well connected at foodstuffs and they actually helped us on board at foodstuffs. Mm-hmm. And um, people s- still say to this day, how did you manage to on board with them? Like, <laughs> um, So we went into the local New Worlds because we knew that, you know, we could support that. We could do demonstrations, you know, the community sort of w- were helping us there. But it's like we didn't want to go and put ourselves on a shelf um, on a Auckland, um, you know, Vic Park you know, shelf and and just have it sit there and people walk past it and not know what it is. I mm. mean, that's that's that, how you you kill your business. Yeah, because you know? it's one thing to get in, but then you've got yeah. to sell off the shelf. That's oh, the hard part. So yeah. difficult to yeah. sell Although off the I shelf. I keep hearing that the Vic Park New World, especially, is like the home of innovation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we just listed with them yeah. last week or maybe yeah, the week great. before yeah. Food yeah. Starter, and we were like, yes, we've made it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're like a pharaoh, and that they're like that kind yeah. of like early edge of um, yeah. the rest of the network. Okay. Yeah, and it's great, like with foodstuffs, those, you know, the store owners can really support local mm. producers, which is which is great. Yeah, um, and of course, we listed with them in February, I think it was, and then March lockdown started for about two years. So we were like, wow, what are we going to do? <laughs> um, no one's going in store and shopping. Furrow sales really dropped off because people Didn't weren't, um, yeah, they weren't shopping for interesting things. Yeah, yeah. It was get in and out as fast as you can with your shopping list. Like that was the, that was basically the mindset for about two years. Um, and yeah, our sales really didn't go far in two years. So we used that two years to do things like Sprout, um, Akina was really awesome. The awards, um, like we won a um, New Zealand Food Award last, last year, year for the yeah. Mexican. That was pretty amazing. We weren't expecting that at all. But just like the <laughs> process of entering the awards and the accelerators, like each one you do, each time mm. you do it, you just um, your business gets better. You know, you you figure out what your purpose is and what you need to do to get where you want to go. Yeah, and if you're going to tell this amazing story. It's not things that you should be doing. It's things that you are doing. And that was one of the things that always spurs us to action. It's like, oh, man, we want to. So what we're talking about at the moment is food rescue. Like we really want to work with food rescue. And we've been talking to them for over a year, but we just don't have the scale to do it at the moment. Um, but we're, you know, we're getting set to take on investment. We're getting set to scale. So we have, we have we've got a three-step scale plan, basically, and we're on step two now. So we increased our production from 50 units a day to <laughs> 250 units a day. Um, and we did it in a very Kiwi way. Like mm-hmm. Dropped very- a shipping container in the driveway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we kitted out, of, kitted out a shipping container, bought yeah. a big um, dehydration unit, um, got in some larger scale cooking gear. Mm-hmm. And the next step for us is... Uh, I think you've spent some time in Japan and we were going to touch on that. Like, you know, we had this crazy experience exporting to Japan, which kind of 
well, fell into our laps, really. Yeah. Um, driven out of COVID, there was uh, two ladies in Japan that used to sell camping and tramping trips into New Zealand. And of course, oh, the books, they, yeah. and, and they used to write books, yeah. And of course, they couldn't. Uh, they somehow they'd tried our product or seen it and they were like, oh, we want to import it. Um, there's a guy down in Queenstown who specializes in connecting Kiwi and Japanese businesses. Like they've got our product there in Japan already and we're having the Zoom call and they're like, hey, we've got Vince. And we're like, wow. <laughs> That's so, so cool. We're sitting yeah. in our lounge in Onorahi talking yeah. with someone via an interpreter in Japan. It was like, mm. and everyone said, oh, it's not going to go anywhere. Don't waste your time and money on it. Mm. Um, but we didn't really see it like that. We just went with our gut and we felt like it might be something that might work for us. And yeah, we shipped off our first um, order to Japan um, a few weeks ago. And it, yeah, it took a few months to get there, but it wasn't, it wasn't as hard as what everyone said it was going well, to be. Well, I mean, as a, we were a startup and when they approached us, we were like, okay, well, we don't have the resources. If you want to do all the work behind <laughs> yeah. behind the scenes to get it, to, you know, to export, then that's fine, you know, we'll sell you the product. And they were just so enthusiastic and loved the product so much. Um, and I kind of really felt for them for the way that their business had gone mm-hmm. to over COVID. So, yeah, and that was a, that was yeah. a good Good match. That's yeah. so cool. Well, it sounds like you two like do hard though, don't you? Like, <laughs> yeah, we definitely don't yeah. make life easy for yeah, ourselves. Like, that's for sure. Know, like think, everything's hard until you've done it, but it feels yeah. like you you two just make stuff happen and do yeah. it. Yeah, and, yeah. And there's a couple of like final thoughts. Like, um, w- you know, what would your advice be to people who are thinking of um, like like I love the way that you said before. Um, it takes a lot of naivety to really start a mm. business. Yeah. What advice would you have for someone who is thinking of starting? Because when people say that, there's always like the other edge of it, which is like, well, you know, it's almost like you shouldn't start, but what do you reckon? <laughs> well, I mean, I think if, um, it's a tough question and we've heard other people, you know, through the podcast series answer it and we're like, hey, we like a little bit of that and a little bit of this. Um, but yeah, like I think um, uh, the guy from Special was talking about ambition. So I think you need to have ambition. Mm-hmm. And I think you need to you be need a little... Pa- you need passion and, and passion. drive. You need to love what you're doing. You need to feel like you are actually um, making a difference in people's lives as well. Yeah. It's the purpose that gets you up mm. every day and drives you forward. Um, and I think doing it with someone, um, I think, is yeah. really important as well. I haven't really heard anyone else say that. Um, but being able to share your journey with somebody, especially your wife or your partner, is pretty amazing. Like we've been doing it for you know almost 20 years now. And um, I know some people wouldn't be able to do that, um, might get a bit much for them, but we seem to be able to do it. And I yeah. think um, just... And reach out for help. I mean, yeah. we, we've we always asked people for help and like doing the accelerators and the um, awards, you know, that's a really important process to yeah, do. Yeah, I think it's just get started, just do something. Um, that was one of the things we learned through Sprout was they made us make a list of these people that were our icons that... In a perfect world, they would be your business partner. So we wrote some names down and then we just picked up the phone and I called um, Michael Fox. I don't know if you know who he is, but um, he's a one of the leading kind of plant-based entrepreneurs. He's had a, um, we'd just been to a VC pitch by Blackbird and he'd grow in a business to like $150 million or something and then lost it all. And yeah. he'd started up this new um, fable, um, they call themselves, so similar to what we do, they make it from mushrooms instead. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to pick up the phone and call him and he answered and yeah, we had a chat to him for about an hour and he shared all his insights into the Australian market and what had worked and what hadn't worked. And that hour was like invaluable to us. Um, yeah, and I think, um, I mean, you need to be skilled as well. You can't just go into it having no skills. Um, so you do, you know, we'd done our homework, we'd done the cafe, we knew what we were in for. Did having, we? Did we know? We <laughs> oh, kind of sitting here thinking, I don't know. I think what we decided was it couldn't be any harder than yeah. the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's, that, that's something we hear a bit as well, where it's like, well, lo- lots of things are hard. Yeah. It may as well be something that's hard that has the possibility to really scale and that's give you hard. a chance to be able to get enough profit to get other people yeah. to do the hard stuff. Mm. But if you're a small business owner, you're never you're you're so often in a trap where you know it yes. doesn't matter how good you go, you're never going to really oh, free yourself up. I, I completely agree with that. Um, that is the trap, and we we. You know, we speak to a lot of other small business owners now and they're scared of taking on investment um, and things like that. But if you want to really have impact and you want to scale, you have to bring in other people that really have probably done it before and somebody that has the money to back your passion and your idea. You'd be a pretty rare person that has this type of money to fund themselves into it. And I I think I've often thought if you have the money to fund yourself, 
you're probably not going to make it either because mm. if you don't have money, you have to be nimble, you have to innovate, you have to do things that no one else has done. When you're accountable to other people as well too, you kind of, you you spend a bit differently. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's your, I mean when it's your own money coming out of your kids' mouths, basically, <laughs> you got to make sure that every cent counts. Um, and I guess that would be one of the real takeaways, I guess, from us is that when you're looking at spending money, make sure there's a reason behind it. Don't just buy a new desk because you think it looks cool. Like that 300 bucks could go into, you know, something that could actually make you money, like onboarding another, you know, retailer or something like that. Um, yeah, love it. And as a final thought, what will success be for you two and for the business? And I absolutely <laughs> love that thing that you gave a call out to how nice it is to work together. Is. Mm, <laughs> that's, yeah. a, mm. that, that's really awesome. Yeah, I mean, probably the toughest question that I think somebody else said that as well. It's the toughest question out of all of them. And yeah. We've been talking about it and... It's not one answer, is it? No. <laughs> um, for us, it's, it's you know, making a difference. I mean, it kind of sounds a bit kind of cheesy or corny, I guess, but it is like we look back at our time at our cafe and we our staff still message us from 15 years ago. And it's just really cool seeing people grow and move on. And um, we, we've never been about money. I think that was that would be one of the things that I would say is if you're going in it just to make money, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult than if you have a passion for, you know, people or, or changing the planet. I mean, obviously climate change, you know, I surf and run and I want that to be there for my kids' kids and their kids. And I feel like if we carry on the way that we're going at the moment, it may not be there for them. I mean, we'd love Vince to be a pantry staple. <laughs> yeah. And we've got um, ambition with other products as well too. Um, but just, yeah, it's all about getting people to eat more veg and just cutting back on the meat. We don't need to eat as much as we are eating, you know. Don't forget the veg. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's yeah. so cool. Hey, yeah. it's been great to meet and chat with you today and thanks so much for um, for coming in. And, yeah, I can't wait to see where you take it next. As um, Yeah, I just feel like you're, you're going to go all the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So thank you so much for coming in. That's uh, Nigel and Debbie Stowe of Vince. And you can find Vince at, uh, at the Pharaoh and uh, also on Meet vince.co.nz uh, and that's m-e-e-t vince.co.nz uh, so get amongst awesome thanks so much for coming in gang thank cool. you thank you so thank you so much to Nigel and Debbie thank you to you for listening uh, and for everyone who helps make this happen like Te Butler our producer do follow Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to rate and leave a review if you like what we do in Ohora. From the Spin Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring. Brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. Talo for Lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.